It was a runaway New York Times bestseller now out in paperback. The book is called The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think, and one of the authors, Brian Hare. Brian, welcome to KTRS here in St. Louis via Skype. What a pleasure. You are the founder of Duke University's Dog Cognition Lab. What is that? Well, we have people from the local community who bring their pet dogs in, and they play games, uh, and we see what kind of choices the dogs make, and then we can make inferences about how they think. And so this is groundbreaking research. What, what, what are some of the, the things we're, we're now learning about the interaction between dogs and, and humans? Well, I think the fun thing to understand is we've learned more about dog psychology in the last 10 years than we had in the previous 100. And one of the big things that we've come away with is more than almost any other species, even our close relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees, dogs are a lot like our infants in the ways that they use us to solve social problems. Uh, so specifically, they're great at using our gestures. Uh, so when we um, point to things or we look in a certain direction, Better than any other species we've examined, uh, dogs really flexibly seem to understand what it is we're trying to communicate in a way that looks a lot like what human infants are doing. Uh, I have a dog. I've had a dog for eight months now. Uh, this morning I left work and I said, Molly, get into the kennel. And she got up and she walked into the kennel. Did she really understand what I was saying? Uh well, it depends on what you mean by understand, but I think she certainly knows that when you say get in the kennel that, yeah, she's supposed to go over there and get in her bed and uh, that you're going to be really happy if, if she does that. Uh, okay. Have, have dogs saved us or have we saved dogs? <laughs> well, I think what, one of the questions we ask in the book is basically how, do do how did dogs happen? I mean, I think if you were going to talk about a successful species – Aside from our own, dogs are really super successful. But it's not clear uh, that that uh, was going to happen. And here's why. is The biggest competitor we had 15,000 years ago uh, was the wolf. We did not have agriculture. We obviously didn't have radio stations. There was no industrialization. We lived a totally different lifestyle. We were out hunting and gathering, and wolves were a pain. They were eating what we were eating, competing against us. So the idea that people would grab wolves, bring them into their homes, and leave them with their children as they went off to hunt is a, just totally untenable. So most likely what happened is wolves chose us, and by choosing us, they had to be very special individuals. They had to be friendly, not aggressive, and they started to reproduce together with other individuals like themselves, and that led to evolution, genetic change, biological change uh proto dogs would have uh um uh, sprung up as a result so uh we changed uh after that i think but the big thing is that wolves decided to hang out with us and that's why we ended up with dogs they self-domesticated they did this themselves correct the, the book is called the genius of dogs how dogs are smarter than you think i guess that's one of the ways Dogs are smarter than we think. They, they decided that they wanted to hang out with, with humans. That's right. I think the other thing to know is that you know, most of the breeds we're familiar with, that's actually – they're only 200 years old. It was really uh, in the Victorian era that uh, there was a lot of artificial selection where humans really actively worked uh, to create all these different breeds. So, you know, in an age where we have iPads and all sorts of things that we – you know, technology gadgets we like to show off and brag about to other people – 200 years ago, that wasn't the thing you did. You, you bragged about the new breed you had created uh, that was really special and interesting. Um, but the important thing to acknowledge there is that you know, dogs are at least 15,000 years old. So for thousands of years, there weren't all these breeds that we know about. This is a 200-year-old phenomenon. So for almost 15,000 years, what were dogs doing? What was their life like? Um, and best we can tell, uh, it's not that humans chose dogs. It's that wolves chose us and dogs uh, were produced as a result. The book is called The Genius of Dogs. It was a New York Times runaway bestseller. Brian Hare, our guest. The book is The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think. Brian, why has it taken so long for science to look at dogs? Well, the first go that we had at trying to understand uh, non-humans or animals and how they think was to focus on primates. They're genetically our closest relative. And if you were going to look for remarkable abilities in the animal world, it just seems like a logical place to look. 
Um, and at the same time, I think there was a bias in uh, the way that people think about domestication. I think most people think that domesticated animals are sort of dumbed down versions of their wild ancestors. But what we find with dogs is the reason they're so successful is they can use us to solve problems that they can't solve by themselves on their own. And as a result, they can solve a whole host of problems that other species can't solve. So when you give a wolf a problem that it, it potentially can't solve, it will just keep trying to solve it. It'll keep trying to come up with a new innovative solution. Even though you know as the human, there's no way that wolf can solve that problem. A dog in that exact same context, within seconds, realizes I am totally out of my league here and turns around and says, human, help me, and therefore they are successful. So they can use us like a tool, uh, just like we use our computers. You don't even understand how it works, but you can use it, and you can solve all sorts of problems. So in, in other words, the dog wants to go outside, cannot open the door, needs a human being to open the door for them. Correct, and it knows how to manipulate us to be successful there. What other... What other what other things do dogs need besides food and and bathroom breaks that they need humans for? <laughs> well, actually, interestingly enough, the thing that dogs want the most, more than other dogs, probably more than food and water, uh, well, maybe not water, but uh, everything but maybe water, are humans. Uh, w when people have done tests where you ask dogs the question, would you rather hang out with humans or other dogs? Actually, dogs strongly prefer to be with people, even people they've never met before, over dogs they know. And when you give wolves the same exact choice, wolves much prefer to hang out with other wolves. They don't want to be with people. And these are wolves that were raised by people, just like the dogs. So it seems like there's something biologically that has changed in dogs since they split from wolves that makes them love us more than anything else. And that's what they want more than anything in their lives. So if, if I'm taking my dog to the dog park to play with other dogs, he'd much rather play with me in the park. Correct. Really? Um, the book is called The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think. Brian Hare, our guest, New York Times bestselling book, now in paperback. Let's talk about inferences. When, when you mean inferences and that dogs can make inferences, what do you mean by that? Well, that's one of the things – that sort of delayed us, I think, from realizing how special dogs are, is nobody really thought that dogs could make an inference. Um, but we have a number of studies that have been used with human infants. Remember, human infants, of course, they're not born speaking. They're not born communicating as we are now. And there are a lot of techniques uh, that have been used to understand what infants are thinking, even though they can't talk. And one of the things we've looked at is when they're capable inferences when you give them a new problem they've never seen before can they solve it can they imagine what the solution is based on some previous experience and say aha it must be this even though i've never seen this before and we've done some games for instance if you hide uh, a toy in one of two places and you show the dog where the toy is not dogs can infer that it must be in the opposite location so never seen the problem before. You don't show them the solution. You only show them where something is not. They can infer, okay, it must be in the other location. Do you have dogs yourself? I have a rare American black dog straight from the shelter. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, does, <laughs> does, this, does this work for cats too, or is it just solely dogs? Well, okay. I like cats. Don't get me wrong. But one of the things we learned by reviewing all the scientific literature in the book and making it palatable and fun to read is there are lots of species that can do things that dogs can't do. There are things that dogs can do that other species can't do. But the one species where I just really couldn't find any scientific evidence that they ever do anything particularly intelligent that dogs don't do uh, was the cat. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So, so back to this inferences and back to humans don't necessarily understand words. They understand the actions or the inferences we make with those words. Is that, is that a fair way to say it? Sure. And I think one of the exciting things is, um, you know, there are now uh, demonstrations, scientific demonstrations, that dogs actually are, in some cases, learning the labels for objects, i.e. words for objects, um, say frisbee, red ball, whatever, 
they're learning that not because they learn some association that they have to sort of be rewarded for and they slowly learn it, blah, blah, blah. No, they're using inference just like human children. And they're the only species that's been shown to do that other than our own kids. And, you know, it's, and when I say our own kids, it's because even adults struggle to do this. Kids are much better at this than we are. Uh, and the only other species that we see do anything remotely that looks like what kids are doing are dogs. But but dogs do dogs know when you're having a good day, when you're having a bad day, when you're in a good mood, when the when you just fired from the job. Do do they read <laughs> your moods, or can they read your, your your moods? So we talk about this in the book. The the best work. Uh, and what science has uh, to help us understand this. And there is some evidence that dogs do understand our emotions. They understand uh, the tone of our voice. Um, uh, this is stuff that people are familiar with, but it's been very um, well demonstrated now that when you have a deep voice like this or you're you know, sort of using a um, low tone of voice that that's, you're probably not very happy. And if you're using baby ease, oh, you're so good. They understand, obviously, just like babies do, that this is, you're pretty happy with them. They, there is some work looking at facial expressions, and do they understand human facial expressions? The neat finding there is when you get dogs to look at human facial expressions, they tend to be much better at understanding the facial expressions of an individual that is the same sex as their primary owner. Really? Huh. Okay. Now, uh, the book is The Genius of Dogs, Must Reading. How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think. Brian Hare, our guest, New York Times bestselling book, now out in paperback. A few more questions for you, Brian. What about, uh, we, you talked about the breeds of, of dogs. People say black labs are smart, goldens are, are dumb, my dog's dumb, my dog's smart. Do you, are you seeing differences in different breeds? So two things there. First, cognition is the recognition that there are lots of different types of intelligence. And they don't always, uh, they're not always related to one another. We know this intuitively. You can be really great at English and horrible at math. You can be a great communicator and you can be horrible as an athlete. There are all sorts of different types of intelligence and they don't always relate to one another. It's absolutely the same story for animals and also dogs. So back to your question about breeds. Uh, currently, when people have tried to examine this question, uh, there's really not overwhelming strong evidence that breeds are radically different from one another, at least on the things that we've measured so far. Uh, I'm sure we're going to find some interesting differences, but remember I told you the breeds are only about 200 years old. And while there are lots of stories about why breeds have been bred and um, you know their functions for why they were bred that way, currently – uh, in the last 50 or so years, breeds are really being bred for their appearance only. And so it may be that some of that functional um, behavior that was originally bred for is sort of washed out a little bit, and that's why we're not seeing uh, many really strong breed differences in terms of psychology. The book is called The Genius of Dogs. Brian Hare, our guest. Last question for you, Brian Hare. While doing this research, what blew you away? What did you not expect to learn while doing this research that when you learned it, you were blown away by it? Oh, gosh, so much. Um, you know, lots of people are working in this area, and so we're learning a lot really fast. And I would say, you know, one of the things that was the most delightful thing to do as a scientist was to read about how different the social system of dogs are, or sorry, is, relative to the social system of wolves. I think that we think that because dogs evolve from wolves that their social world is the same it's not at all so for instance one of the coolest things that i discovered in the literature was while wolves have a very strong hierarchy and there are certain individuals who are dominant it ends up that in the world of in the social world of dogs where dogs have gone feral where they're living without human interference it's not they don't even have a particularly strong dominance hierarchy. And in fact, the leader in the pack is the individual with the most friends, the most affiliative relationships, not the dominant individual. So things like that were really fun to learn. So the alpha dog myth doesn't exist. Uh, it is truly a myth if it's based on the idea that dogs have the same social system as wolves. That's just absolutely incorrect. Fascinating stuff. The book is called The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think. Brian Hare. Uh, New York Times bestseller. Brian, thanks for checking in via Skype. Good luck, and we'll talk to you down the road.
It was great fun. Go Cards. There you go. Back in a moment. Big 550 KTRS. <laughs>